um, the Cinco de Mayo um, celebrations here. Um, <laughs> my name is Karen Studd. As you know, Lynn Constantine was going to be the person who was presiding over this, but she had uh, some commitments around the whole snow issue of changing schedules. So she reluctantly could not be here, but continues to watch this. And we're very fortunate to have some past um, uh, presenters here with us today as well. Really what we're going to be doing more than anything else is just kind of doing um, a reflection on what's happened this year, uh, how successful we've been, um, and where we might be going in the future. And we have some uh, responders who basically that's their job is to jump into that uh, arena. Um, so they may have thought about this in great detail or be talking off the top of their head and either is perfectly fine. Um, before we get started, I'd like to just um, pay some kudos to Lois Tetrick, who's the director of the center, and uh, in absentia, Mark Thurston, the senior um, uh, fellow, fellow. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, and of course, Stacy Luther, who is uh, the program manager, who is always on top of everything and gets us connected to everything here. Um, also, please pay attention to the fact that you have a wonderful group of little flyers here to give you information about what's happening at the center, to pass on to others, uh, potentially, if, if they are not directly applicable to yourself. Um, and certainly, if you have any interest in participating in being on the round bag committee, there is a roll sheet going around that will uh, take your information and you can indicate that there. Um, and any? The, uh, the survey that you see in front of you, is actually the same survey that's online that was sent out to the whole community earlier this week. So if you filled it out online, don't feel like you need to fill it out again. However, if it would be easier for you to do it this way, I'd be happy to enter it for you. Yeah, so you have many options, many options. And first, our thanks also to Michael, who uh, makes this live streaming possible. He has been wonderful in having this. Uh, it's been a very valuable aspect of this for people who could not be here or wanted to go back and relook at our presentations. Um, so that's been very, very, very helpful. Um, the respondents today, uh, although I think of all of us in the room as being the respondents in some sense, are Vicki Kirsch, who is an Associate Director of Women and Gender Studies at Mason. Um, and also has a private psychotherapy practice in Fairfax. Her specialty areas include trauma, recovery, sexualities, and those places where the erotic and the sacred intersect. And then we also have uh, Rachel Marquette, who has received her BA in psychology from GMU, and is currently a research assistant in Todd Questions, I'm trying to read with my, no, my glasses, I'm sorry, um, lab for social anxiety and character strengths, where positive psychology research frequently highlights the role of consciousness in psychology. And then we also have Earl Rabel, an associate professor in qualitative research methods and higher education at JMU, and her research critically explores the intersection of faculty epistemology, uh, academic identity, and professional ethics in higher education. And as I mentioned as well, we have some of our previous uh, uh, present uh, presenters here, and we have so we have old people and new people because I know there's some people who haven't been here and this is their first time. Uh, as well as committee members. So we have quite a interesting and diverse pool, I think. Um, essentially, as I mentioned, the idea is for us to really kind of focus on what this series has done over the last um, academic year. The first semester, the um, emphasis was on consciousness, and the second semester, the emphasis was on transformation. So with that in mind, I'd like to throw out two basic questions. Um, the first one being, what have we learned slash taught each other about consciousness and transformation? And have we progressed in defining, identifying those concepts? Because that was part of what we were set, we set out to do. So that's basically the first area. And the second is really about the future. Where do we want to go from here? And that could include topics. That could in include individuals who we would bring in as presenters, and that also could include the format. Right? So all of those areas are possible for that idea of when we think about planning next year and beyond, what would we do and what would we like to do? Um, and I would actually like to start this off by handing this over to Earl, if she doesn't mind, as being the first person to respond, and, and then please 
know, other presenters jump in there. I see myself only as kind of keeping us on track, um, but I do want to feel that we get some time to really have this open for a uh, general discussion of everybody present who would like to comment or question. Okay, well, thank you, and I wasn't expecting that. So, okay. <laughs> let's see how, how I might, might initiate this in trying to stay on topic with the questions. What have we learned? I did review all of the presentations. I was able to attend all but one and found it very fascinating. The things that I focused on, I came in as a learner. I got to hear people not only stand up and present from their expert base, but then I got to hear questions from different people from their field of expertise as well. So the whole time I was sitting here going, well, I don't know that, I don't know that, I haven't read this, where, where can I read more about this? And I would go home and take notes, and I would Google like crazy. But then when it came back to it, it ended. So what I learned was that, and I always go back to epistemology, and whether something is real or whether it's real because I know it to be real, is that when we were together, and we had the energy of people talking back and forth, I was knowing it. I was excited. I was happy to be exploring, whether it was consciousness or leadership or interdisciplinarity. I was excited in that hour and a half. The moment we walked out, I went back to my meetings. I went to my Google, which is what I do uh, all the time. But we didn't have a way of bringing it back together. So I would like to see in the next phase that we find a way of maybe tying that bow together. The other thing for me is this idea of voices, and this is what I'd like to leave with the entire group today is that what we had were experts, and we can name people experts, we put quotation marks around there, but when they stood up, they had their PowerPoints, which I was prepared to do today, but I'm not allowed. <laughs> no, kidding, kidding, kidding. But the, <laughs> but the idea of expertise is uh, there were references, there were, there were definitions that were shared by other scholars who, who brought evidence. To the mix and then there were respondents who were also experts in their own fields so we had the battle of the experts and then we had very little time and kept watching the club but very little time for someone like me going i've never read that i, I don't know what that thing is so i'll i'll hold my question till the end because i didn't feel comfortable and i feel like i'm a pretty i'm okay i, I can read a book you know, now and then but I got caught up in, in sometimes the language dragging me into this. If I don't understand it from your perspective, how can I ask you a question? So for me, going back to the Habermasian perspective of dialogue is we have to suspend our own definitions for a while and truly enter into a conversation here rather than me telling you what I know and then listening to see if you go. So that's, that's where I would leave it. Or that's how it started, not how I leave it. No, thank you so much for that because, um, so I'm delighted that I did put you on the spot in my life. Uh, because again, as I'd like to reiterate, that was my goal here is for it to be much more of an open dialogue as opposed to the um, presenters um, coming in with a prepared presentation. Well, I think it was just a time issue. And I think people got excited and with the structure of the room, and I do care about that, is we have an inner circle, and then we have physically an outer circle. And I know that that's not intentional, but it does impact how we can see each other and how we can communicate across the table, so to speak. Because for me to include you, I have to change my, my line of sight. And it then becomes a didactic relationship with someone out there rather than with the people. So bigger room, please. Okay, so we'll take those out of the room. So she's really jumped into the second part in terms of like looking at the future and the format. Yeah. Okay, very good. Um, do you mind my putting you on the spot? Since I saw you did your homework um, and respond either to what Earl has just said or again just your reflections over having been someone who has attended these. And what you like Earl, I came in just to kind of learn and everything just to observe, so um, I did learn a lot. Um, learned about how flexible the idea of consciousness is, um, especially from the first talk, the first one I went to, I think it was the first talk, the seven mm -hmm. definitions. That was really interesting, um, learning about how we're conscious to some degree, we create conscious, we find consciousness, we find it in all these different places, so that was very interesting. Um, and, and talking about um, how to how to work with that in here? Yeah, I think more time maybe um, or some sort of strategy of including people um, somehow would be really good because I think it is a really um, broad topic and it's not about pinning it down and telling someone what it is. It's about reaching that um, together. 
and trying to uh, use what everyone knows about it to <clears throat> to get a, to a higher kind of sense of what it is. So I would think more, more time would be good, maybe some sort of, um, I don't know, you could even do like a message board or something, I don't know, <laughs> but some way of including other people. Um, and I thought your voice was so wonderful to have here today with us also because a little bit more the idea of the student perspective because generally this has been uh, faculty around faculty development and um, so any thoughts on that that you have to share? Um, well, I think it'd be great to bring this um, into student life more. I'm graduated, but um, right. and I'm not sure what's available to students as it is. Um, I, I feel there's going to be a mindfulness um, some new college LLC. So, uh, so that that's really cool. And a minor, which you have a, which you have all have a, a handout about. And um, I don't know. I guess on a student level, you could basically do the same thing. You could even bring together faculty and students to talk about um, just the same kind of stuff. So I think I think students would be really interested in uh, talking about this more. There actually is a way in which this has come into one of the gender studies. Um, Samantha Doak, for some of you may know, she's a fellow um, in the Boston Bible CCT, has been doing a group in women and gender studies every Monday um, for an hour and 15 minutes. And it, it's a combination of um, meditation, some yoga, some writing together, you know, journaling. Um, and she worked through um, the, ch the chakras of the body. Um, and that really has transformed our community. A lot of students are mostly Christian. But it's a place where students and faculty and staff come together. And it really is a wonderful place. I'm trying to get kind of a number of like this. You should ask for a year. It feels like a year. One or two. But um, one thing that, um, for all I was, I was interested in what you said about, you know, that when you were here, you felt, you know, that um, connectedness, you know, with everyone's presence and that you knew somehow there was like this like knowing and then you got that in your office. And I think that that kind of connection with consciousness is something that at least in the first semester, um, it seemed like all of the um, speakers really touched on at some point in their um, presentations that, you know, consciousness is about, you know, the small in the large or the connection between um, in Hinduism, it would be Atman and Brahman, that the self and the divine self. And that that's really where consciousness is. And one thing that I thought that, you know, we touched on some of the, some world religions or some spirituality sometimes, but I think it was never really explicitly named in any of the um, talks. And I think that's something that, at least, you know, that I think would be helpful. Well, Vicki, I want to follow up on what you just said because you mentioned something about the, the application, taking it back and actually doing something with the information, which for me that was exploring through Google and trying to, to get a firmer sense of what I was hearing and then maybe reading something or taking it into my classes. But I also saw the themes of the theory practice split show up across each of the presentations where there would be, well, on this hand, you have people who are writing about it, and this is what it is. And we always got different definitions, which is kudos to everyone who presented. They always gave us nuances and different approaches. They never said, this is what it is. But even by naming it, even when we had, I think the first one was on the seven types of consciousness, is this idea of, well, maybe there's more than seven. And I know presentations, they have, you have a certain amount of time in the spotlight. But this idea of everyone then admitted that we're not sure this is all. But then what do we do with it after that? So one of the things that I, I heard all the presenters saying is, well, now that we've talked about it, what do we do with it? And the, the groups that would pop up after the presentations, that's where I saw the movement headed was with, oh, I want to talk with you just a little more about right. this. Right. And that, you know, talking more like you were talking about like, the room and what happened in the room. Mm -hmm. I felt like a lot, or not a lot, but some of my learning took place in that, you know, I sat next to different people mm -hmm. every time. And so I got to know that person and we talked a little after or during. Um, so 
so that's where, you know, for me, it was some of it was about what was happening in the center, but it was also about what was And I wanted to go back to a content analysis of all the responses and the questions, because as I was reviewing the presentations, you could see the heads doing this, or this, or the scowl, or the bodies <laughs> leaning forward, and you could just say, I'm not going to say anything. I'm Today. Well, you didn't have as well. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, trying to throw technology in. <laughs> I think the idea of kind of trying to include everyone is a really good idea, and maybe not worrying so much about turning different people off at different times by the things you say, but throwing something out there for everyone. Like you were saying, religion can be brought into mm -hmm. it. Um, how about also you know quantitative data? You could have that whole range so that everyone has something that they can kind of sink their teeth into a little bit. So. Mm -hmm. So did you feel that we got any closer to our um, coming up with kind of a definition for consciousness and or transformation through this process? Or is basically this is a work in progress that we're going to be continuing in much the same vein? <laughs> yes, I'll jump in. Uh, yes and no, and I don't mean to be trite on that, but we did get closer in that we identified individuals perspectives of what these terms might mean and if those are the people who are then the experts the internal experts then those are the definitions that we'll begin with i'm hoping that we will retain a sense of wonder and the idea that okay well today we're naming it this way but maybe tomorrow we have a different perspective and we actually honor those people who come in and argue rather than putting up with them. The, the idea of naming is something that bothers me anyway, that the moment you have a definition, you then have a way of understanding the construct. And you don't you don't see a lot of people that will just go outside of that construct once they have to learn that definition inside the three sources is you know, list at the end of the references. And so it's it's the idea of do we really want to name it or do we want to keep it open? Which is uncomfortable. I see you doing this. What are you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> I, just agree I, I, I agree with the notion that once you, if the goal is to define it, that by definition limits the conversation because you're shooting for some sort of a, a agreement rather than you know, to me it should be going this way instead of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what about the counter argument that if it has no boundaries, then we're sort of in sort of an endless spinning of the wheel, right. and that we can we can sort of meet both aims, which is as you as you described it, and I haven't been the round bag, so take everything I say with a grain of salt. Is is that each person comes in and, and sort of provides some information or evidence or knowledge on a particular realm of consciousness or transformation, with no inclination of they're they're planning to map out the entire field of consciousness, but without any definitions or, or clear concepts. I mean, we just, if we go back to Elon Vital and the ether, right. that's what we're playing with. Well, and, and the idea of, of that is the critique of critical theory and the critique of, of deconstruction anyway, is that if all we do is look at the possibilities for endless questions, then we never get the answers. And when I teach research, it, it's like there, there must be an end to everything. So we build in the end, but then we start afresh the next time. And this idea of being open-minded and willing to question is not the same thing in my mind as tearing everything apart. But having the spirit of, if you say something, I then bounce off of what you say rather than trying to fit you into what I was already saying. So a, a spirit of inclusiveness in the dialogue. But yes, at some time we, we might have to actually write a definition, just as long as there's built in this option to change that definition. That's that's all. Right. So it's ex explicitly sense. allowing for assimilation slash accommodation at all times in everything. The power of dissent. Going back to Habermas, yes. that yeah. if, if we if we really want dialogue, first we have to admit we can be wrong. We also have to admit that maybe that other person might be right, but then honor dissent. If someone disagrees with us, that's not a negative thing. That's actually a good thing. It shapes us in a way. That but I think trying to craft that yeah. was really useful. Mm -hmm. I mean, we haven't really done, you know, tried to do that. Um, and I remember a time you speaking about wanting to have kind of a GMU. Yes, Something. our own definition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, at least for the beginning. And I still think that what I propose means understanding consciousness as a complex adaptive knowledge system is a good definition because it covers whatever 
should be covered by the city of this I interpret it from Marcus' perspective, from the traditional perspective, from psychological perspective, from evolutionary perspective, etc. And it might be interesting, I think, to, to use this definition and to provide seven or maybe 27 or 77 interpretations, which would provide our context and would allow people coming from different directions, from various directions, to draw in and to provide understanding. They understand. Yeah, and I think you can also, jumping off on that, yes. to see the idea of connecting the dots, all these yes. various possibilities, yes. as not yes. necessarily um, creating such a situation where you're you know, limiting how many dots there are. No, I see it as a kind of ontology. Yes. A complex system, dynamic system, regularly updated or well, expanded. I see it as, and, and I think the first year was exactly what it needed, it was what it needed to be, and that is it laid the foundation for us to jump into the discussions, and to jump into discussions, we had to have terminology. That means you can agree or disagree with that terminology, so you're not fixing your, your understanding, you just have a baseline. And then after that, we start adding the knowing process, which includes critiquing, and I call it playing with. We now need to play with these terms rather than just be stunned by them. Because I have, you know, I've read on consciousness, I've read on transformation, I've read on leadership, I've read on all these, but from my own perspective of what I know. So I, I don't want to enter into it. Every time I come into this room with it being, oh, <laughs> I've got to read something to understand this. I want to get in and grapple with it. Well, and also a way to have all of those specific applications connect to each other. Well, that's the well. ontology of it and the epistemology yeah. of it. Yes. Not always just having that, that reality, but having my relationship, the position of me in relationship to the construct, rather than the construct always in relationship to the expert. Yes. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is the theory, practice, follow through. So do you feel that way now? Yeah, I do personally. I do because I, I have gotten to talk with some of you individually and I, I have I did attend on all but one of the presentations. Um, I happen to know some of you individually, so I've heard you in other venues and I mull this over because these are my areas of research and so I have the luxury of time and interest. But if this was something casual to me, if it was something just an extension of my day, I don't know if I have that time. But then also being asked to come to this table and be responsible to you as a group, that's, to me, an honorable responsibility. So I had to think about it in a very concise way. So being forced to, the, not forced to the table, but being, <laughs> well, yeah, the word didn't come out right, but you know what I mean. It's, it's I felt I could stay over there, but now I'm here, so I have a different responsibility. So I plan differently for the material, and um, it is a responsibility. You know, it, it seems to me, I mean, what you have here is this group is a perfect for a community of practice, basically, and you're talking about how you want to interact, and you're talking about message, which that's kind of a limited thing. You can expand it and get your processes first and just get the technologies to you up. But uh, as you're talking about, like, dialoguing and then discussion, or dialogue, really, you're trying to trace out the whole landscape, and then discussion kind of going, maybe batting back and forth, trying to figure out actually coming up with Answers and then, but maybe then going back and forth, you know, iterative process. But uh, what was I going to say? <laughs> uh, oh, I'm sorry. This is what happens when you have many thoughts. <laughs> Remember, uh, you want to change the world. We, we said uh, that early on. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot what I was going to say. No That's fine. I'll come back to you. Please, Michael. Tell me about the extension. Sorry to draw your attention to the camera, Earl, but um, I, I feel like is sometimes a scribe role here would be worthwhile. Um, not in the linear fashion, but I've seen a couple of recent and wonderful examples of, of mapping, of thought mapping and mind mapping that are three-dimensional and flexible, and um, I've seen some people that can use the tools very quickly to end up with a visual and a verbal representation of, of a sort of a conversation that is reminiscent of a, of a constellation of influences 
and the language around the influence. Has anybody else seen this sort of mind mapping yeah. tools? Yeah. 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 If you do it well, it, then it's it's a it's a very profound way of describing what's going on, and a great and a great reflection tool. So we might want to think about uh, next year hiring somebody and teaching them how to use. There, there's a couple of great ones out there, and they're they're cheap or free. Or even letting one of our research students who wants to use this in her his dissertation Indeed. use this oh, as an really? option for extending their dissertation yes. or her thesis work. Mm -hmm. I just happen to look at it. But but for me, that would help me after the fact if I, I mean, I can go back to the video, but mm -hmm. if I had an opportunity to look at the mind map, which sometimes mm -hmm. can be, you know. Mm -hmm. the, the, hundreds of feet long uh, in relationally um, but that way see how we have moved from from one thought to another and what influences the next few moments and in that way perhaps distill that over time to some of the dominant ideas that that we generate repeatedly actually you hit on an area that's actually something I'm hoping to Really go in a major okay, way you have in my the permission next. it's not necessarily my mapping because I don't think that's necessarily I think a lot of graphical tools and maybe some new things that are really necessary to get the basic shape of arguments but then be able to tie them in and all in a graphical way instead. And I, actually that's partly what I was going to, I forgot what I was going to say is that if you have, like what you're saying, oh, if you have experts, you're right, they're not in the field that they're studying this area, this model, uh, they're not going to have that time and that's what, you, and you can't expect that, but you really want it with the interactions just to learn through that and maybe not expect them to look that much, you know, reading books on things that are outside their expertise, they just won't have the time, but they could find that in interacting with each other and archiving it in a way, and then also, like you're saying, having a nice road, well, not a roadmap, but kind of a encapsulate the thought visually and have links that you can continue discussions and, and actually there are ways that you can base that on some rigorous logic type of things that you can put together, have moderators determine what fits into the argument ultimately change that map. That, that's, yeah. And I think that's a good, um, a good way of thinking about where to go from here. You know, you have people who can talk about consciousness in all the different fields on campus, so why not have them do that? We can get all that information and think about what links up, you know, what, what goes along with what, and learn uh, new things by doing that. Um, even, you know, in, in student life too, you could have um, the way that consciousness uh, works in, in the various subjects that the students are learning about, and what can they bring from, from incorporating consciousness into what they're learning about. Yeah. But one person who's really into some of this, but in a different way, is Robert Horn in visual language. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's actually written about a book on visual language in visual language, where he's actually saying this is a naturally evolving language, not like Esperanto, which people created and never took off. This is something that's actually occurring, and I'd recommend you get that book. <laughs> but, uh, but he's also very heavily involved in putting up some of these maps online and actually having these type of discussions, kind of what I was saying, but based on what he's talking about, he's been doing it for a number of major issues. I haven't looked in this for a few years, but um, that's something. Please. Um, shifting a bit, I just wanted to say for me, um, I have sat through all of these, of course, and um, I found that the more provocative the presentation was and the discussion was, to your point, Rachel, not worrying so much about pleasing people who are in the room and, and coming to agreement, but instead to stimulate. Like, Paul, I thought your your presentation was quite provocative, and I think by design. And I think that stimulated some really interesting discussion, some real passion in the room. So I think um, as we're looking forward, again, Rachel, to your point of thinking more about letters maybe a little farther out there um, that might stimulate us even further and, and open up, you know, get us out of that comfort zone, kind of think about challenging us a little more. My favorite quote, Carol Gilligan, conflict oh, is the harbinger of growth. It really is, and we think of conflict as something that needs to be uh, solved or, or conflict as, as a problem, and conflict from a dialectical position is, is here's the opportunity now for us to move forward and without conflict physically, intellectually, cognitively, it, we, we stay who we are. So. I think consciousness kind of goes above the conflict level where you can see more about the about what's causing the conflict and have a kind of more open view of the conflict when you have it when you're 
have a sort of an open, very conscious attitude towards it. You're not. Um, Presentation as well. I think also what you're saying is being able to step back from my own head and see the right. conflict in my own mm -hmm. in my own cognitive processes as I'm sitting here, being able to step back and almost do a meta analysis of my own. Uh, you know, I think that's to me that's where the best. I and mean, I think of my own teaching around issues of social justice as creating and then helping students work through cognitive dissonance. That's where the best learning occurs. Um, and without that dissonance, um, it's, it's, uh, it's easier, uh, but not as fruitful. Right? Are you familiar with Liz Sassius and her work on participatory consciousness? No. Because you, you remind me of that in your presentation, and also in what you're saying now, where she talks about we as, she's speaking from the position of researchers, that this idea of we have to work through our subjectivities, and I somewhat agree with her and somewhat disagree with her because I'm pro-working through subjectivities in our research. She says, enough, we've spent so much time, like you were saying, asking all these questions that all we end up with is a lot of questions. And uh, Liz says what we have to do is understand that when we come to a research venue or to the table or whatever it is, we're coming with our consciousness, we're coming with who we are. We don't need to apologize for that, we do need to be aware of that. But that other person is also coming to the table with her, his consciousness. And again, we're not trying to change it, alter it. We're trying to understand. So the point is where we're creating a third, and it's a relational consciousness, that we're not disallowing you and me. We're allowing for a third way of knowing each other that goes beyond any subjectivity and goes beyond me trying to get a word that I then know you understand me. So I can say, perspective transformation, and through dialogue, we can come to a shared definition. You still have your own definition. You may not be telling me all your definition, but sometimes we shut down the way we think by having a shared common ground. And participatory consciousness doesn't do that. It says you can keep who you are. I'll keep who I am. And we'll just have three ways of knowing you. Well, it isn't the way that in doing that, you just really are actually, when you're discussing, interacting, you're actually getting a better handle on the assumptions you're making or from others talking you'll get a better handle on yours as well as on others. So in other words, you're really exposing all of your assumptions and the interactions in order to get a better handle on issue from multiple perspectives that you wouldn't have. Well, the earlier work on identity and the self, this idea, I think it's Boober who did the I and the me and or I, thou, and this idea of, we tend to think of ourselves as concrete, very separate individuals in, as, in terms of our relationships and self that I am in a relationship with each of you in this room right now. But what Luz is saying is that there is the, the non-concrete, the, I, I don't know the word, I'd have to go back and reread it, but it's, it's beyond that. It's, it is created in the moment, it is social, it exists only in the moment. Ephemeral is the best word, but it, it is not something that I'm going to take with me. It is in the relationship, in the moment. So when I came in here and I said that, that I felt different about these terms in this room, that is participatory consciousness. When I was with you, hearing you, talking with you, I was relating to the material differently than when I even took the memories of that, when I took it out the door, I was again alone with it. Now I had the, the plays in my head of, oh, he said this, or he presented this, or she asked mm -hmm. this question. But again, it came back to me figuring out what those meant, rather than having that in the momentness. I think it's called situated knowledge acquisition, in the context of a given situation. Mm -hmm. and something that can be understood only in the context of a given situation. And we are creating this context here. Exactly. Yes, situated. I, in my language, in my field, it's situated learning, going back to yeah. communities of practice, yeah. Laban Banger, that's, social that's, area that's learning. That's what I was just yeah. thinking. Okay, just, yeah. Like Eddie Wenger actually came here for us. Oh. Uh, I don't know if you saw it, but yeah. he, he was talking about that people who are uh, like wine connoisseurs and all interacting together, they say, I have the taste of purple. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and what does that mean? But they understand perfectly what that means. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Are there specific topics to go back to what Stacy was saying in terms of you know things that, that like social consciousness and uh, transformation of that? Are there other specific topics that people would like to see a lot of this explored through? 
ideas for specific topics that somebody I, might I want to admit, talk about? Yeah, I must admit that I'm subjective, of course, this my present one of my present interests, but I think education. Education. Mm -hmm. How to bring all these great ideas to, for example, engineering education, mm -hmm. which is driven not by theories or formal models from psychology, but by engineering practice and evolution is incremental, very slow, while we need revolutionary changes, paradigm changes. So there is a contradiction between what we can do in the context of our limited understanding of fundamentals and what should be accomplished using the power of consciousness, for example, mm -hmm. psychology, etc. You know, I actually, I've been an engineer for 30 years, and I'm, I'm working on a doctoral dissertation now in education. <laughs> and uh, uh, the, the, the thing is, I, one of the courses we, I took was Ways of Knowing, mm -hmm. so you can know from all different perspectives. Mm -hmm. Engineers, any other discipline never gets that, because I've had an opportunity being in all kinds of disciplines. <laughs> kind of the same and uh, I thought that would be the greatest course that would be a requirement for everybody, particularly like engineer well, actually everybody to take that course because you're right, when you look at these revolutions, that those are people that are coming from a different perspective. And I, I can see when I'm in different communities, I worked at NIST also in that for for old standards and just look even different labs, you know, they couldn't there is difference in interaction and understanding because they were coming from a different and they also have a manufacturing center, which is a, which is a business unit there. I saw that. They have a completely different. And the thing is, when you're in a particular discipline, the people there don't even realize that there's another. They don't realize it, I swear. And but they're operating from one consciousness. Yes, right. And so that's what I'm saying. If there was a core, this, I think, like as an undergraduate, and everybody should take that course or along the way so they have a, that they understand that there's other ways of warranting knowledge. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think it's no, you know, here we are at a university, and I think all of us would agree that the idea of education is that it should be transformative. So, I mean, it seems like a, a you know, a no-brainer that, that the education would be a focus. But it isn't so obvious for people outside education. For us, for engineers, education isn't about so much the transformation. Mm -hmm but providing detailed information about sizes of bolts or types of bolts or welds and very technical, very pragmatic information. Not about changing attitudes and changing uh, thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, as a designer and engineer, see, I think that, even though you're not supposed to say that here, I think that idea is totally wrong. <laughs> it's what kind idea is that, that Engineers, do, I believe, I agree with you. Engineers think that way, and I think yes. that's the wrong way of thinking. Yes, of got course. To, well, this somehow, there's got to be a way to get that word out. Well, maybe not wrong way, but limited way. You know? Yeah, it's, it's, of course, factual knowledge <laughs> or engineering, purely engineering knowledge is absolutely necessary, but not sufficient. Well, at some point, we have to tap into either what faculty and students want, so they will spend extra time doing X, Y, and Z, or we have to tap into what they need, whether it's faculty evaluation or how to do this thing better. But I, I think in terms of when we would come to the presentations, I came because I was interested in a broader body of knowledge. I had no idea what you individually were going to talk about until I came in and heard it. Afterward, I would go back and say, Oh, I wish I'd invited so and so. Oh, I wish I'd known. So I think that a little bit of pre planning and making materials available so those of us who can connect individuals, because I will do that. I, I will I will hip hip hooray for, for the group if I know how to invite people that will fit. The other thing is if, if we can make sure that there is, we go back to the theory of practice, that whatever it is we're trying to accomplish needs to go beyond just learning for the sake of learning. Now, I'm all for that, and I will do that. But if we want to change people's practice, we might have to give them a clue as to how we might do that. So how might you integrate this into the syllabus? What might you need to cut out in terms of content to include process? Because frankly, we still only have 15 weeks to get our material across, even though there's so much more to share. So we have to think structurally and, and literally but we're yeah. also up against something else, which is an increasing in, in the schools that students are coming to the missing from undergrads. Anyway, um, they are more and more going in the opposite direction. And so 
you know, different ways of knowing that. I think it's great that that's an education program, but coming from an education program myself, basically what I see is more and more uh, is that teachers themselves are learning basically to be technicians and, and not to think about them. They're preparing students for tests and there's a lot of group learning. And and skills so, acquisition. Yes, and so part of what faculty need to know how to do is help students unlearn a bunch of, mm -hmm. of because in a sense what, when I'm trying to do this in my class, I often feel like I'm teaching against every other influence in the student's life. Yeah. And, and that's, uh, that's really hard. And that's even being within New Century College where I think we do a pretty good job of uh, you know, looking at intersections of different kinds of knowledge and different things. That's what I share that with you as well, obviously, but I think that it would be wonderful to dedicate time together to more practice, the practice focused groups, you know, brainstorming groups where we actually came in and did the work with our, you know, our courses or helped other people mm -hmm. to transform, you know, their courses. It's just much, you know, very hands-on. Practical. Yeah. Practical. Just a point of clarification. I think what I'm hearing a little bit is like a learning community. Mm -hmm. Is that? Yes. Is that something that appeals? Yeah. Oh, please. Yeah. I, I just wanna, I'm just going to toss this idea out. No, I don't want to move us away, but it's sort of it kind of connects to everything that you were just talking about. Um, one thing um, that would, I think, help us with um, some of these challenges that we're talking about, and, and I, Earl, you're kind of feeling like there's a connection, disconnection, connection, disconnection happening, or it's that slide that you, that you're talking about this need for more practice, which you know, I've heard before too. And this is now an idea, not about the brown bags, but it'll, it'll make sense after I say it, because it'll connect up. Um, but what if we, um, through CCT, sort of dedicated some resources and said for you know the next two years, uh, we're going to fund um, consciousness and transformation Curricular and co-curricular projects, um, you know, across the curriculum and co-curriculum. So consciousness and transformation across the curriculum and co-curriculum, so that um, uh, you know faculty and, and staff in particular would have the opportunity to um, you know work in small groups or individually. Like so, for example, if I wanted to teach a new course, create a new course that had themes around the educator and consciousness. So I'm just going to toss that one out. Um, then I would apply for this funding and be in community, like a learning community, with everyone else who's going to be working on funding projects for maybe a week or two in the summer. And get a stipend, you know, um, and any kind of small resources you would need. Or if it was a co-curricular kind of program that would get at, um, you know, furthering the work with students learning in consciousness and transformation. I'm, I'm making this up as I go along. Um, uh, and then bring the groups back in community over the course of the year. But the expectation and use of the funding would be, at the end, you're going to have either a new course created that you'll teach you know, in the near future, or a revised course that you um, have had the luxury of some time in thinking partners with, um, or you know, uh, new student programming around consciousness and, and, and transformation. Yeah, I think that's an excellent idea. And what do you think? I, well, and I'm on the Gen Ed Committee, which I've been on for quite a while. Um, and, it, you know, so that makes me think about that quite a lot in terms of how do you get the people who are submitting these proposals for such and such a course to be accepted under whatever Gen Ed rubric. And I think that would be wonderful if they could be in such a learning community, um, because I sometimes feel that it's so compartmentalized, and I know teaching many, many gen ed courses, that that is probably the most difficult thing to get across to students, that this is not about skills. You are not probably going to be whatever this field is, like the arts. So yes, you're not going to be a performer, but why are you taking this class? Why does Mason have, feel that it's valuable for you to be invested in this class? So, yeah. Could I add? <clears throat> Let me share with you my experience at my Global Center of Excellence in Computing. Oh, we had this similar idea, but we decided not to develop courses in the area of computing, but 
teaching modules. Mm -hmm. And each teaching module is equivalent more or less of one lecture. And now we have 15 or 18 such modules, which are available on the web, and can be downloaded by people from all over the world. And every week, at least two or three people download these courses, uh, these modules. And surprisingly, most interest comes from Asia, from China, from Hong Kong, from Korea, etc. And each module is supposed to be self-contained. They were reviewed as regular journal publications, so they have good quality. And in this way, you can compose all kinds of courses or use only a single module. For example, seven definitions of uh, transformation, something like that. And I'm like, yeah, that's yeah. yeah, that's I think that would be a, a sort of in the mix of what yes. would be. And uh, uh, it could be used, uh, these modules could be used to propose one, two, or three regular courses, or used as part of other courses, as our contributions mm -hmm. to the GMU community. But it is very difficult to propose that module. Yes. Yeah, I um, well, I, I just wanted to comment on what you said, yes. so I wanted to add to uh -huh. it, because I like the idea of mixing and matching the modules, uh -huh. because not every individual has the exact same needs. Yes. And then you could also have maybe I just say competing modules, but mm -hmm. I don't mean in the terms of competition, but you might have one person taking this perspective and then you yes. have someone else. But also you could use Skype or some other technology where then you have a meeting at the end of it where you interact. I love the interaction. I don't want to just interact with my computer. I want people in my life as well. So I could actually see there being some culminating point or event mm -hmm. where you come together. Mm -hmm. Skype just happens to be my What I was gonna say, I'm, I'm kind of a contrarian just in general. And, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but uh, uh, and I think you know, in theory, I think that sounds good, and I think it's got some usefulness. But I think better is really to have practice, have a project, or that one or more students can come together and kind of define on their own that cuts across multi disciplines. And I mean, that's maybe difficult to incorporate, but we have to I'm not saying. Yeah, I don't, I don't think they're cross purposes. No, I think that not, students could have that, and faculty yes. could have those projects and yes. use the modules as a jumping well, off point. And, and I think without, you still have to have a baseline. <coughs> okay, but I think without the practice, I think I think they have to both go together. I think just with the theory without that, I, I just really question. I'm too sorry. I have to go. I have my office hours. No, no, it's <laughs> I know that there's a <laughs> long so line of students waiting for me. So. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. Thanks so much. So much. And, and we are getting close to our, our you know, so I just want to make, to make sure everyone gets an opportunity to respond and get us back on track. Also thinking about that idea of topics. This started off with the idea of education, and then of course, um, uh, when Michael had brought up that idea of mind mapping, I mean, we're, we do have some concrete things that have been thrown out, as well as this larger idea of the process that we're kind of grappling with to try to come together as a community around these ideas of consciousness and transformation. It sounds like what I'm hearing from all the responses is there's a, a chance to make the brown bag format more flexible in that the, the aim of a particular brown bag may differ from one week or one month to the next one. Mm -hmm. Where it, and as long as we set that framework ahead of time, what that's going to be, we're not going to have these, this sort of dissonance of, I really would have liked to have an interaction component of it, where here was a skills-based training for someone who has particular expertise on computer engineering or something that's going with it. Some of us have, have just, you couldn't possibly prepare us even with Supplemental readings ahead of time. There's just we're just at ground zero. We're yeah. below yeah. that. We're underground. Yeah. <laughs> so, and having that, that would be a type of brown bag would be more didactic and be mm -hmm. kind of a, so you would have the really an expert and a bunch of minions, including myself. And then other ones would be much more interactive, which we're talking about the idea of maybe one on education policy, where the person doing the brown bag wouldn't much so much be the expert as a moderator of setting things going. Mm -hmm. And if they could create brown bags that are more flexible from the get-go. It's very clear of uh, what the aims were in before people get there. You have um, optional slash supplemental readings that are short, brief, not a book. If people can get ahead of time, maybe even a website that people are exposed to. So I get, if I give a talk on uh, you know the evolutionary nature of social behavior, there's some good websites I can point you to. And if you want to get crazy, here's some scientific articles that you know pour yourself to tears to read. But having that ahead of time so that people can come in and not be uninformed, and it serves another purpose, which is that 
they can learn this twice. One, they can learn it by this very passive way of getting this information. Second, by actually hearing the interaction mm -hmm. take place face to face. And then the third one, which is you know, what you're describing really nicely, which is the dialogue that happens during and afterwards. And I think if we keep a more flexible format, as opposed to trying to box ourselves in of everyone's going to have a tremendous amount of dialogue, um, everyone has to have this massive practice initiative afterwards, uh, I think we'll end up being reach the point of stagnation where we're going to be doing nothing as a result of that. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree with that. My question comes up for you about this because um, I think you were earlier the one that said, okay, well, but how do we demark, draw the lines? Is a one hour, one hour, 15 minute format, you know, three times a semester, basically once a month, is that something that you see as doable for this? Because it seems to me that some of what you're describing might be something that really was a two and a half hour experience or really was so how do you handle, how do you believe we would handle that? I mean, in, in, in every place I've ever been to, giving colloquias at different universities, being on the receiving end, um, an hour and a half format has always been suitable. You raise it two and a half hours, you just knock down your ten right, like right, percent. Right. There's no question about that. I mean, I would never commit to have to be my topic yeah, yeah. that you have to do, which I already know, and I want to kind of see what's the new <laughs> thing on. <laughs> okay, well, you've already opened the window an hour and a half as opposed to the hour, hour slash hour 15 minutes, which we right. have been doing. Yeah. So, does, does, that's it also brings that up. Well, um, I also like the idea of combining or thinking how to put these different ideas together, so having that, and I do think an hour and a half is, is necessary but also have the modules, also have this coming together in terms of the learning community, um, maybe you know, in summers or, or whatever, but having the different options for intersecting with different people, because there are, I, I'm now working on a couple of different research projects where the ideas spring out of discussions, but it just happened that that other person also was at the meeting, and so there, there's no way of connecting us to each other unless we continue to show up. And I ask the question, that person says, oh, that's who I am. Right. <laughs> that was my idea. Well, this is what I think Rachel's idea was uh, kind of dismissed or maybe ignored a little bit quickly. Of the message board is, is a nice baseline starting point. Mm -hmm. It's not the answer, but it's it's a fast, fast move in that direction mm -hmm. without that, where you do have an actual physical trace of what's happening afterwards, I think is a really important avenue. And that mind map that Michael brought up. Oh, I, like that. I like that too. Yeah. Yeah. I think a, a sort of an uber topic that might be rich uh, for us would be sort of the, rel the relationship between conscious transformation and well-being in general. Uh, for instance, uh, a particular interest of mine is uh, the, the, the influence of, of the evolution of consciousness as we be become more and more virtual selves uh, on things like student development, uh, young child development. Uh, things like that that for me are sort of uh, having a 15 year old daughter they're pretty they're pretty immediate and I'd like to learn some more about those sorts of things. So education, wellness or well-being is kind of a larger topic area as well. But, but I liked what you talked about as the virtual self I and mean, as we all use the internet more and our younger generation use it incredibly more than, than we do that they are developing their identity in a different way and staying connected and yet still, you know, having that virtual self on that. It's something I'd like to explore because I just don't know enough about that. What that means in terms of consciousness and transformation. Well, and that's very, that's something that very personally gets home with me because I'm a somatics educator. So, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, I, I'm so much aware of the fact that the field of somatics has yeah. boomed basically as we have become more and more virtual. Yeah. So, you know, that's how he's I also love the idea of more, um, well, I like the idea of the moderator uh, as opposed to just the presenter. The presenter and questions is a very traditional way of doing things, but the moderator just opens up this guide to, this sort of a guide to learning and discovery, which is what we sort of come here for. Um, I like that. I like the idea of having some free uh, things on the internet to read or to explore. Um, when we did the one on positive psychology, I went all of like my girl does and Google around and see if I could find so I could learn more so that when I came here, I, I could not just enter into the conversation, but I could enter in 
into my mind about what I thought about it. I had a sort of place to begin to think about it, and I think that would be helpful. Yeah. It doesn't have to be books to read necessarily, but suggestions of books and suggestions of websites. And yeah, no, I think that's what we're great. I think that'd be really great, great as preparation. Yeah, because yeah, think... these are rich discussions, and and they're uh, and we're all here um, because we are learning. Well, and I think to go back to Earl's part two and to piggyback on that and, and follow up, which I think the message board can also serve as, so that it doesn't just have to do with the physical interaction that we have here where people are engaged in this give and take, but the, you know, the, the precursor to that and then the follow through or aftermath of that. So it's not just a discrete event that sits there by itself. Well, I, I, I like the idea of the message board beforehand because one thing is um, a presenter has their preordained material. The message board happens beforehand. They start modifying what they're going to present exactly. because they kind of get a better idea of whether what it's exactly going to get excited about. And I know for me, if I was going to present it around it, I would love to have that dialogue to inform what I'm going to do. Because you don't we, know who you're right. We make, we make a guess. <clears throat> we make a guess, and we can be really off the mark. And if, if it's a if it's a 30 minute or 40 minute presentation, you can be way off the mark. Mm -hmm. And I like the idea of, of retooling the idea of the, the message board to not just be a thing that I, I do over there. So it's not this didactic, I relate to the message board. It then becomes interactive, and I like that. I like that. Mm -hmm. And I, I love the mind then. Mm -hmm. Across the mind and space, yes. Mm -hmm. And you can have thoughts after this physical meeting that you might think is you know, pretty pretty good. You want to share, you want to put it out there, and not have to wait for the next meeting. Maybe you it about it, forget about it, so you have a place to say. I was very happy just to get the links to the presentations because while I attended them and I took notes, those notes, who knows where they went. And it's, I remember general topics, but I didn't remember the points. And I really found it interesting to go back and watch people ask questions because it's what you're saying. You're, you're having to watch someone deal with interacting with an audience that they couldn't presuppose. And I think that we've tried to like decenter the experts here, you know, as much as we're able, but I think that in this we're doing mm -hmm. Because I think there have been a lot of people in this room that we have. Yes. So not only the people that we didn't invite because we didn't realize you know, that the topic was going to be in this room. Yeah. Well, and I like the idea of purposely saying to try and attack the status quo traditional approach to medics. Because the way it's the way it's designed now, and I always try to de-emphasize this in classes, is the reward is the person who's really good at extemporaneous thinking. Right. And that's we don't really care about how the speed of processing. We care about the quality of the ideas. And so this is where the message board beforehand and afterwards. We don't lose those people, or even more introverted thinkers, which is they just like to need to meditate on ideas. Yes. And so the more that we can have that, the more we don't just have the quickest gun that is drawn as ends up being. And which is we've all seen this in our career in our departments. It's the same people because they're quick thinkers and or they're contrarians. Which by the way, I'll go myself the same. And I wonder where, how you would um, access the message board if it would just be like through the CTP website or anyone could, could see that and, and generate some sort of uh, idea? I would have to take that under advisement with lots of people know much more about that kind of thing than might be. I, Rachel, I would think it would be something that everyone could see yeah. and it would be interactive so it could build. Yeah. So it wouldn't be just, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna put in a comment and it's gonna go somewhere to a presenter that I'm never gonna see again. Right. Yeah. But that might stimulate other people's thinking. So that's what I'm thinking. A good friend of mine, Sean Miller, I don't know if you've heard yeah. of him, but he works in the uh, well in tech, education yeah. technology, yeah. helping yeah. professors throughout the university create courses online. So he's really interested in communities of practice and I mean I'm sure he could help and I'm like helping too, but right now I'm kind of busy. <laughs> but uh, you know, to help a group like this help put up something that would could evolve and start small but grow into something more. Might be on my portal. And you can increase the attraction to CC too, which is people look at it, they find it, and say, "Oh, I should have been for my vision of the next one." And the idea is, the way this started out, CCT being there at the beginning, was we were uber inclusive for everybody. Then people dropped off because they felt that their ideas didn't get enough weight weighty. And now we're kind of where our group is. I think what you want is organically to bring people in or attract the message. So we want some way the message of the idea that these things are available online, but the message for as well is 
these are the topics. I didn't even think that was part of the presentation because they get a one-page blurb about what the topic is going to be. It might morph into something completely different. Right. And we want to make sure that people recognize mm -hmm. we might move into politics, we might move into education policy, we might move into entrepreneurship, you know, who knows what. Right, right, right. And we want all that to be an advertisement for CCT. It also becomes a way to document the existence and sustainability is this idea of you have a history. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, it's, it's not that we must be a thing and never change, but we must be a thing and then that it constantly has a presence to other people and that just has a way of, of having an identity. And I, I do have to say personally, because I, I am in the College of Education and Human Development, but we don't have uh, departments. I'm not a member of a program. I teach qualitative research, my PhD is adult education, and my research is, is faculty issues. So I, I'm affiliated with higher education in terms of my professional identity, but I come here not just to learn, but to have an identity with you. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the being with you, not just being me here, I am being with you. And, and I do think that the Brown Bag was conceived of that originally as the idea of faculty development and mm -hmm. support. Mm -hmm. And so I do think we need to at least um, come back to that notion, and, and even if it goes someplace else, um, you know, acknowledge that. Yeah. Well, I have enjoyed it immensely. Oh, yeah. <coughs> that's that's. This is my group for now. Well, there's still food, so please make sure that there, if you haven't had uh, something to eat, grab something, and please do fill out the survey and fill out the surveys. And